This is Photographing the West Podcast, the podcast for people who love to explore the western highways and byways while photographing the landscape and wildlife. And now here's your host, Kirby Flanagan. Hello, and welcome to the Photographing the West Podcast, that is, brought to you by Flanagan Photos. Twice a month, we bring you interviews with interesting people doing interesting things. Most are photographers, but some are specialists in related fields. Today, I have with me author and excellent nature and wildlife photographer, Jeff Rich. Today, Jeff and I are going to discuss blinds or hides for wildlife photography. Welcome back, Jeff. Thanks, Kirby. Appreciate you having me back. It's always good to visit with you. Uh, Likewise. So let's start by talking about the pros and cons of using a blind or hide. Obviously, uh, there are some some issues, so tell me about those. Okay. Well, the uh, the pros, I like to start with the, the pros, I guess, and that is um, uh, the fact that a blind can help you, you know, blend into the animal's world without them maybe realizing you're there, especially birds and things that don't have the greatest scent. Uh, but the main reasons for uh, a blind for me are to basically cover up the human form and body shape, um, uh, stop any movement that you might make that really uh, can scare animals. They can't see that movement, so I can move around a little bit in my blind and they don't notice that movement. So breaking up the human body form, uh, blocking the movement, um, and then getting into a position where, you know, they are close enough to your lens. So I think those are the main pros. The cons, you know, are, I guess, you got to carry a lot of stuff around and you got to find a good place to set up your blind. And, um, but I I mean, there's mostly pros for me once I've got it figured out where I need to go and what I need to do. Okay, sounds good. So in what situations would you use a blind? Well, I think... And maybe this is another pro as well, but uh, once you're in the in the vicinity of, of the animal and they don't realize you're there, that's when I can get those great natural behavior shots, which um, I think that's maybe even a pro, uh, the main pro perhaps. But uh, I try to, you can't just set up a blind willy nilly. You've got to have, uh, you know, a plan. Uh, The animal's got to be coming to the area for whatever reason. So a feeding area, I like to find feeding areas. So like if you're in an area where the the water birds are coming in, uh, there's a lot of good food. Maybe it's herons uh, coming in for fish or something in a pond or a wetland. uh, And they like this one stretch where there's a pipe maybe coming in from the the, uh, refuge or from the area that dumps the water in and keeps that area active with food sources, maybe fish or other invertebrates, stirs it up right there. Uh, and the animals are keep coming back, birds. I use blinds a lot with birds. Uh, maybe a, another area where they would come back all the time and you always see them there, you know, in your backyard, if you have a bird feeder, uh, they're gonna come into that. Another feeding situation. Uh, the nesting situation, which is a whole different story, but nests are uh, the only time I'll, I'll basically photograph a nest. Uh, definitely use a blind, and I don't want the birds to know know I'm there. So there's a whole process, and every species is a little bit different on how you do it. But uh, thinking of ethics and the animal's welfare is extremely important in in setting up a blind. So for me it's a place where the animal is already using. So if I'm in an area and I get to know the area and the animal movements and the animal behaviors of that area, then I'll uh, notice, hey, they keep coming to this spot for food or they're they're coming back to this area, then that's where I'll set a blind up. And I'm always checking for the light and the direction and and getting everything lined up the best I can. Takes a lot of scouting, in in other words, to uh, find a good place, huh? Right, yeah. I mean, if you just go set up a blind willy nilly, uh, there's a good chance you're going to be, you know, taking a good book with you because nothing, nothing's going to come. And they know there's a blind there, you know, unless it's a permanent, there's many different kinds of blinds, which we'll talk about. But the, 
you know, if there's a permanent blind that lives in the habitat and the environment uh, day after day after day, they become used to that. But if you're adding a blind uh, that's, you know, more temporary, they're going to notice it's, you know, something odd. And depending on how badly they want to, you know, use that area, that's a wrong word maybe, but how frequently they use the area determines how long it takes them to get used to it. So sometimes I'll have to like set up a blind at a distance and slowly move it in and see how they are affected by it. And sometimes I just can't set the blind up because they're too affected by it. And again, every individual is different. So it's it's kind of hard to say there's any hard and fast rules, but scouting is important. And then thinking about your subject and the picture's not worth it. Because like I said earlier, I'm looking for that natural, unique behavior that the animals will do. And if they're stressed out and know you're there, you're not getting that. You're getting the other look, which is, you know, a butt shot, I call it, as they go away or or some stressed out uh, animals. And that's not fun. I don't like being around stress in my own life. And I don't like being around stress when I'm with my animals uh, and they're stressed out. It's just, it's not what it's about. So you've really got to be cognizant. That'd be the ethics, I guess, of it. But it's also um, the scouting and and seeing how everything is used to that area. Well, well put. Um, one of the problems uh, that I have is um, where can you put a blind? Uh, certainly, uh, in some places, particularly in the national wildlife refuges, uh, depending on the refuge, uh, you may or may not be able to put a blind of your own up. Uh, sometimes they have their own blinds, but those aren't necessarily where the birds are. So uh, where can you put a blind and uh, how do you go about uh, finding a place? Yeah, so if you're on public land or, or on private land or on land that has rules, you certainly need to look into all that and find all that out uh, so that you're following their rules. Excuse me, if you're at a refuge and they have blinds set up, then, um, you know, sometimes if they're well set up, uh, and what I've found in general terms is if the refuge has um, photographers help them or the refuge personnel are photographers, then the blinds are often uh, more productive. So I like going to areas like that. And we have some of those in, in Northern California where they, um, the refuge personnel are great wildlife photographers and they have great blinds that the public's able to either sign up for and get a, a permission to use it as a scheduled time or um, if they are allow you to set up your own blinds then you've got to get that permission um, of course in your own yard if you're doing birds and and bird feeders i think um, birds is probably the most often used for me of a blind uh, then of course you can do whatever you want in your own yard keeping the animals welfare at the top priority uh, but yeah, if you're in a national park or things like that, then, you know, they're probably going to have rules and different rules and everybody's different. So that can be a con. There's no doubt about it. But it's it's mostly being aware of that and what those rules are and then trying to work uh, within that. Uh, another my favorite uh, one of my favorite blinds is using my automobile. So the situation is most, you mentioned wildlife refuges, and I love photographing in those as well, is they have tour routes and they let you drive your car and quite a few of the refuges, the tour routes, I can get great photos right outside my, my car window. So my blind then in that case is what I call my portable uh, movable blind. Uh, it, it actually moves and the animals get used to people seeing them in their cars and the car then becomes part of their environment and they get more used to cars and if you stay in your car that's what they're used to seeing then the animal generally will go about its uh, natural behaviors but oftentimes of course they fly away from the road too so it's just every individual is different in that case and you just have to keep trying so locations are wherever you like to go and wherever you can find animals and then if you're on a place like that certainly you've got to follow the rules again the ethics come into play uh, if you're out in you know some areas that don't have those kinds of rules then again you uh, create the rules that are the best uh, for the animal uh, not necessarily for your photos again though you're looking for why the animals there are they going there for a certain reason uh, feeding 
and um, maybe breeding areas. Sometimes the breeding areas can be uh, good for setting up a blind as well. I like photographing grouse. Are there opportunities to set up blinds on private property? Are property owners open to that kind of thing in general? Uh, many of them are, yeah. Everybody's different, so it's just a matter of approaching. And one thing I, I like to try to do, and I know you've done this too, and it's you know, it's it's a win-win for everybody. But if I'm in an area, whether it be private or public or refuge, and I'm photographing and and working in the area for uh, for a while, then I'll you know try to go in and and find a way maybe to give back. So some of my local refuges around uh, Northern California where I live, um, I've done all kinds of blind work uh, where I wasn't photographing. You know, I was helping uh, clean them up, set them up, fix them up, paint them up. Uh, move them around, you know, just try to be helpful and making those relationships with those people, whether it be a private landowner or or a, a public manager of the land, uh, building those relationships can sometimes be helpful. And every again, everybody's different. Not everybody's into photographers, uh, you know, and some people are more open to it. And if you can find a situation where the person's interested in photography themselves and or uh, photographers, then those are the areas I try to focus on. And that way I get that access. Yeah, that makes sense. Are blinds expensive? Uh, can you make your own? Uh, if so, how would you go about doing that? Yeah, I know. It's a good, good question. I think there's both answers there, but me personally, I started wildlife photography way back. Uh, I've been doing it a long time now, over 30 years. And I started when I was in college. I had no money. So everything I've done is is on the cheap. And I continue to kind of have that mindset. So I've always built my own. Uh, but I know there's companies that, that make them pre-made. Uh, my first, you know, again, the car. I love that one. Uh, the first, What I call my terrestrial blind. Uh, the one that I can portably move around and set up is basically uh, got that idea from John Shaw's book uh, back in the day that that he wrote. And he had basically used a slide projector stand and sewed a cover to go over it. So basically, um, for the uh, people that don't remember, slideshow and slideshow stands. Uh, so basically what I did was I took a piece of plywood about a foot and a half by a foot and a half square and I attached some PVC uh, T-shaped uh, pieces to that board and then I cut some PVC pipes for legs and uh, and then my wife helped me sew the material to, that goes over the top to hide me and it's real simple, real cheap and real portable and real light. And you can build that to customize. I'm not the biggest person, so mine's not real big, but a bigger person probably wouldn't be comfortable in that. I like to to do that. My favorite blind is my floating blind, and, and that one I also uh, got a design from someone. And both these designs are in my book, The Complete Guide to Bird Photography. So if you're interested in looking at some of those uh, designs, I have those and some pictures and, and how to build those more detailed in that book and um and the floating blind i took the the fisherman float tube that fly fishermen fishermen like to float around in and i built a cover for that so i get down in the water so yes i think uh they're expensive you can buy your own you can make your own so when you're floating blind are you wearing waders or how do you how do you do that how do you move the blind around yeah, so the floating blind is, you know, this inner tube uh, that's floating on the water with a seat in it. And I wear chest waders and get in there. Um, and then my lens is basically resting on a little platform I built that fits right on the inner tube. So the lens is maybe five to six inches off the water. And then my feet touch the ground. So I, I'm in that blind in water that's shallow enough my feet can touch the ground. That way I can control where I am and and um, move around. I don't move around a lot, but basically the floating blind gets me down at the water level. Like if I'm lying on the ground eye level, it's a water level. 
and that's really why I do it. Uh, but I'll move around a little bit if I need to, but generally I get in there and I don't move because movement, as I mentioned it at the beginning, is one of the things that you want uh, to try to avoid because movement catches the animal's eye and generally they don't like it. So do you get uh, nervous putting your big lens on an inner tube? No, uh, but if my feet did not touch the ground, I would be certainly more nervous because, you know, I have this top going over me, which again is PVC pipe and material, but it's not heavy, but uh, still there, you know, there's always that concern. But as long as my feet are touching the ground, uh, I don't personally feel nervous uh, putting my big expensive equipment out there, but um, you've got to be nimble. Uh, you've got to feel comfortable, you know, uh, moving around. It's not for somebody that isn't into comfort when you're in tight, cramped quarters and you have the ability to kind of maneuver and work around easily, you know, so it it's not easy for some people that uh, that don't have that ability. So you do need to be somewhat nimble uh, in those settings. And and then once that, and you feel comfortable like that, then I, I don't think there's really a worry about your big equipment in the water, but there's always a risk. And I've, you know, I could tell you, we could do a whole nother podcast on how I've damaged my equipment and how it's fallen here and there. That's where you have insurance, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I've got too many stories uh, to tell on broken equipment, equipment dropped in water and everything else. But when you do it as long as I do, then, you know, it's bound to happen. Yeah, for sure. So some people use swim fins, I guess, to move the uh, waterborne blinds around. Uh, you ever done that? I have not. Like I said, I, I want to touch the bottom. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. everybody's different and there might be a situation where you'd want to move more. Um, and build your blind so that you can move, and that's uh, certainly an option. Not one I've been uh, that interested in, but uh, I could see the potential of it, you bet. Do you have any recommendations as far as waders are concerned? Uh, there's a whole, I mean, that's a whole other topic, I guess, but uh, uh, having looked uh, through Cabela's uh, many times, there's... Uh, uh, some are insulated, some are not. Some have uh, built-in boots, some some don't. Uh... Yep. Yeah, the waders, um, you know, again, you've got to be comfortable wherever you are. Uh, those are basically the, the three main kinds, the, the stocking foot waders, which you can pick up at Walmart, you know, for probably under 50 bucks. Um, real thin, you wear a shoe over it. Uh, the ones with the, the heavier rubber boot attached to them, a little heavier, a little more durable. Uh, and then if you want insulation, um, you can buy them with, with insulation. And of course they have all kinds of things because so many fishermen, duck hunters have used them over the years. They've really gotten customized and you can get as into it as you want, uh, depending on where you're going to use it. So in the summertime in Northern California, the thin stocking foot waders for me are are really comfortable because the water's sometimes most of the time cooler than the warm air and gosh it feels good uh, but i've been in alaska uh, with my floating blind and i've um, gotten so cold that um, you know it took me a good 30 60 minutes after i got out to warm back up uh, even with insulation on so you know every situation is different you've got to pay attention to your your uh, where you're going to be your temperature the water uh, and your personal safety and, and health. And that is extremely important to take care of all those things. So every situation might offer a different answer. For me personally, I go with the uh, cheaper version, the stocking foot waders. I probably have to rebuy them every other year. I have to put patches on them. I'll put my insulation on under my waders because they're so bulky. I can wear, you know, multiple, um, pants and and uh, long johns and warm socks and even heated socks if I'm in a real cold setting but you know I don't tend to get into icy water but if I need it to uh, that's how I'd go about it but again everybody's different so uh, obviously you've had a lot of experience with blinds why don't you talk about some of your experiences the good ones and the not so good ones <laughs> oh Let's see. I guess the not so good ones would be, 
when I didn't get the photos and I had to, you know, uh, shut, shut down the project. So that happens, you know, uh, frequently and you've got to be, you've got to be open to that. But the good ones are just some of the, the photos, you know, that I've gotten to create. Uh, so really unique. I think one of the things that I really like about the floating blind is not a lot of people do it. And when I offer my my photo tour for for my baby birds and, and I bring my blinds, um, you know, probably the least people want to and, and, you know, use that floating blind of mine. Uh, it's probably the one that the least people want to get into. And it is, you know, scarier. It is a little more and you have to be a little more nimble maybe to use it and feel safe in it. Uh, so I understand all that. But what it's done for me is given me this really unique view um, and angle that people don't see much. And so working with editors and photo editors and magazines over the years, if they see some angle or some picture that's unique and different, you know, they're getting these great photos uh, to put in their book or their magazine and they see, you know, loons and oh my gosh, what a beautiful bird. And then my photo of of a Pacific loon shows up on their desk and I'm actually lower than the bird kind of looking up at them is, is really this unique view that they hadn't seen. And it really helps the background getting low like that in the water. And so those are um, some of my favorite experiences is just getting just this eye to eye level view, a unique view where the animals don't know I'm there. And in my, my most recent book on bald eagles in the wild, uh, I talk a little bit about a blind experience I had out in the Aleutian Islands where I spent a couple days and, and nights in my blind photographing at an eagle nest. And, um, you know, I've got a whole bunch of stories from that situation that are kind of fun and funny that you can you can look about in, in the book. But uh, having the opportunity to photograph, I wanted to photograph the eagle nest where I wasn't standing there and the eagle adults are all stressed out screaming over your head and you're taking a picture of a baby. That was not what I was interested in. I wanted to have a picture of their natural behavior feeding the chicks in the nest. And in order to do that, I needed to set my blind up in the dark, you know, before so I wouldn't stress them out, which up in Alaska in the summer is, you know, two in the morning. And um, and then I just lived in it. I didn't want to get in and get out. And and um, so getting the opportunity to photograph both adults in the nest uh, with their chicks, feeding the chicks was was a fun experience for me and and not, you know, a real common shot to get uh, looking down into a nest um, and having all all four in that case in view. It's kind of a, a really neat experience for me. And I really like those kinds of experiences. I think that's the main reason I do photography of wildlife is what I like to call those National Geographic moments just to experience. Yeah, those are uh, super when they come along. I think I remember reading in that book, uh, it's you and the, and the blind went tumbling down the hillside at one point. Uh, am I remembering that right? Well, the uh, I was scouting where to put the blind in that, uh, in that situation. So uh, the eagles, I wanted to go out to the Aleutian Islands where there's no trees and the eagles are nesting on the ground because I wanted to get that view down into the nest. So uh, this one nest that the um, the biologist on the island uh, showed me that would be a good one uh, to use and they were monitoring all the eagles. And so we were up there, showing, they were showing me the nest. And so after I left them, I went up to scout it. And I went up around the back side of the cliff and looking down into the nest and trying to figure out where I could place my blind safely. And that's where, um, so I didn't have the blind set up yet. And that's where uh, all of a sudden I was, uh, next thing I knew I was rolling down uh, the hill uh, towards the edge of the cliff and, and had a throbbing headache and realized that uh, the eagle had come down and hit me from the backside um, and knocked me over. And so that was oh. kind of a scary, scary situation. Uh, yeah, and I, I found so. out later, yeah, I felt really bad because I thought I was really bothering the birds, which obviously I was, but I wasn't uh, that close to the nest. I found out later from the biologist that 
those eagles, the parents, um, were attacking people down in town that weren't even near their nest. So that made me feel a little better. And then, um, and then after that, I got my blind set up in the right spot at night and, and never had an issue. But yeah. it was a little spooky at the time, being up there yeah. with a bloody head in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, I would think so. From my experience, at least, uh, working with uh, bi uh, wildlife biologists in that situation uh, isn't always easy. Uh, they're, you know, very protective of the wildlife and of their the uh, territory that they are in charge of. So, how did you manage to get them to cooperate with you to be able to take those kind of pictures? <laughs> yeah, well. Maybe being a wildlife biologist by training myself helps a little bit and then having, you know, just a, a fairly good reputation over the years of being ethical. Uh, definitely building these relationships that I mentioned earlier is important. It doesn't always work out. You need to, you know, find somebody who's, you know, conducive and maybe has their own photo interest and then they're interested in getting pictures for their work. And so I'm always giving back. I mentioned how I help with blinds and, and things. I'm always offering pictures to these researchers for them to use in their presentations, which they need to do to promote their work. Um, so I'm offering, I'm offering that kind of uh, help. And, um, and sometimes it works and sometimes, you know, they're not interested and I, I understand that. So uh, it's just a matter of keep trying. And I think it also helps for me. It's also helped, you know, I have these projects and I have a, a history of making books, writing articles. And so um, that really helps too. One magazine I work with is here in, in the state is our local fish and wildlife, state fish and wildlife has a magazine. And so I, I write for them and that gives me access to biologists as well. Uh, because they are, um, you know, all part of the state program. And so I've gotten in the back door that way and had the opportunity to work with some really, really interesting people. And then for me, uh, focusing not just on that animal, I want that shot of the eagle, but I'm really interested uh, even more today in the people stories, because these people that are doing this work are really fun to learn from and um, and write about them as well. So I really am interested in in the works being done and take a genuine interest in documenting that as well, kind of a photojournalistic look. And the animals are part uh, part of that story. Uh, and of course, my main interest has always been people. When I started out years ago, I didn't want any sign of humans in my picture. Uh, but now I've uh, changed my mind and, and including a human element sometimes can tell a better story photojournalistically. So for people that don't have uh, all of your qualifications and experience, what recommendations would you have for uh, beginner uh, wildlife photographers or would-be wildlife photographers for being able to get close to wildlife and to be able to even use blinds uh, anywhere? I would say start, you know, in your own yard. I would say practice to, um, you know, to hone your craft so you feel comfortable and uh, experience taking good photos. Start in your backyard, whether it literally be with a backyard bird feeder or or literally be the, the local park uh, down the street or wherever you have. If we're talking, you know, wildlife uh, in this case, where the closest place you have, maybe it's an hour drive, maybe you have to drive three hours for me. I say three hours is my backyard. So if I can be there within three hours, I feel like I can get there any day, pretty much any time. And I consider that my backyard. I say hone your skills close to home. If you have the opportunity, a friend or a family member that has a yard that they'll let you put up a hummingbird feeder or bird seed feeder or something like that, start practicing. And when you're out and about in the local parks and, and local places and out on your hikes and, and enjoying nature and you run across, you know, some situation like maybe a killdeer nest, for example, uh, they nest on the ground right in roads and parking lots and driveways. 
Um, that's where I started. Um, and I, I remember finding a killdeer nest in the middle of a of a gravel parking lot. And, you know, they're so used to cars driving around. And I was so worried a car was going to drive over it that I just kind of drove in there and parked my car and set up my blind. And, um, you know, the birds didn't even pay attention, you know, uh, it just, they were so used to that kind of thing. So my recommendation is that uh, for uh, somebody that's uh, starting out, I would also recommend probably signing up for, you know, a photo tour where, you know, you can go to a place with a leader who has that experience and, and that gets you in as well. And then once you have your craft honed and you're getting some good photos, then, you know, like I've mentioned before today, maybe go out and start making some of those relationships at a place you'd like to, uh, to work. Some of the best advice I ever got on bird photography in particular was to go where birds were used to people. And yep. at the time, I didn't uh, think, uh, I thought that was one kind of obvious and uh, two, I wasn't sure that was really work, but uh, experience since then has taught me that uh, that was quite good advice. And I've gotten some of my best uh, photographs uh, in public parks and uh, where people were walking around and the birds basically just ignored them. So, so that's a good place to start in in my book anyway. What do you think? Oh, you're exactly right. There's no doubt about it. And, you know, you probably don't need a blind in that situation, but you can hone your skill. And I think that needs to come first before you start, you know, knocking on, on those biologist doors. But yeah, I like that idea. I, what I like to uh, look for, is what I call a cooperative subject. And so I might spend all day, well, let's just say, for example, I'm on a refuge in my car and I might spend all day and, you know, do the tour route and sitting and parking and waiting and looking and, and, uh, and I, you know, I might find one animal that whole day that is cooperative. And once I find that, you know, I'm not going to take the picture and go, yay, I got a, I just got a great shot of a buck. Uh, for example, you know, I, I'm going to just keep staying with that animal and try to get some better, unique behavior shots um, by putting in the time and energy. So I'm looking for a cooperative subject, and then I stay with them. I don't just say one shot and move on. I'm going to spend time with them. Um, and so the cooperative subjects that you're talking about are found where people are are uh, there all the time and that's that local park down the road or that refuge where the cars are always driving around or your own yard where you have your bird feeder so great advice start there get you know what you need um, photographic wise and talent wise and ethic wise and then start branching out after that and maybe practice using blinds since this podcast is focusing on on hides and blinds is um, you know practice using blinds in those situations like in your yard uh, with the bird feeders or something like the kill deer nest in the parking lot, uh, those kinds of things. Because even though they're used to people in the parking lot, uh, I still don't want them to realize I'm moving, I'm right there, you know, within view and I'm moving around. I want still to kind of hide and disappear into their world. And their world in those cases does involve people milling around, driving around, walking around. So if I'm in my blind hiding, then that's even better. They can get back to their natural behavior because when somebody's not paying attention, uh, kill deer on a nest, for example, uh, the other mate might come in and they might change places and talk to each other and uh, a predator might come by and the bird might have to do his feigning, feigning injury display. And so, um, you know, just, putting in the time, you know, I'll spend hours in a blind waiting for those cool things to happen. And you asked me earlier, what are some of the bad things? And the bad things are I sit there all day and I don't get a picture. That happens too. Uh, but you can lower those odds by going to places where, um, you know, the animal's going to be coming back. Like places where they feed and uh, mm -hmm. where there's water and those sort of things. I assume yeah, exactly. you're talking about exactly what we're talking about and that you know that nest the kill deer nest for example so um yeah water holes we haven't really mentioned that's a good one kirby uh animals are attracted to water so setting a blind up at a water hole that is a great 
uh, place for animals to come in. And places where there isn't water, uh, you know, drier areas, if you are in a wet Seattle neighborhood, you're probably not going to attract too much with water. But uh, in the desert, in the drier locations, animals need water to live, so they're going to find it. So that's a great one. One of the things I learned through experience was uh, how much difference there is between species uh, as far as uh, being able to get close. Some of some of them you can uh, drive right up to, and some of them, uh, as soon as you roll down your window, they're gone. So uh, learning which species are tolerant of uh, people is another uh, another key issue, I think. Uh, for sure, and every individual is different. So you're going to find a, maybe a species that's more skittish in general, but within that species, you might find that one cooperative, what I call that cooperative subject, that one day, um, and you may get finally get that one uh, species photo. Uh, and then there's other species that are in general more tolerant, but I even take it down, and I don't know if that's what you were meaning as well, but to the individual. And every individual has a different tolerance and every individual uh, has different needs. And uh, for example, deer in the rut or, um, you know, birds on their uh, courtship uh, land. Last summer, I was photographing in a permanent blind overlooking a uh, Andy and Cock of the Rock lek, a nesting area, courtship area for the, the Cock of the Rock, which is just a really unbelievably looking bird and you know they're there because they have one thing on their mind and the breeding season uh, can do that to animals and so a buck in rut or an andean cock of the rock um, they're going to be just singing their hearts out or smelling in the case of a deer looking for a mate and uh, they generally might become more tolerant at that point because they have other things on their mind very true, and uh, particularly with uh, birds and uh, water birds, uh, if they're feeding, they generally tend to ignore you as well. I remember watching great blue herons, and if they're uh, looking for a fish, uh, they ignore everything that's going on around them, or if they're not, they're gone as soon as they see you. So That's uh, right, and then if I'm in a situation like that and I come back, and I see the heron there again an hour later, then I know he wants to be there and there's good food and that might be a good place to sit and wait, set up a blind and wait. So uh, those are things to look for. Yeah, exactly. So do you ever use a canoe or a kayak as a floating blind? I've never, like, to me, a blind, I'm covered up and hidden. Uh, I've definitely photographed from canoes and kayaks, but I've never built a, a blind over it. Uh, it would be like a floating blind. It would be a great idea for those those who like to do that. I, I do like photographing from the water level and kayaks and canoes are great ways to do that. And you could certainly uh, build a contraption uh, for yourself that customizes your canoe or your kayak that would become a blind. I like that idea. I have not uh, personally done that, but I've certainly photographed from kayaks and canoes. Um, and then my floating blind is is the one that I generally end up hiding in. So if you're in a kayak or a canoe, can you get closer to wildlife than if, uh, if you're tromping around in the woods? And that's a great question. I think, um, of course, you know, in this case, we're talking about water, water birds because we're talking about being in a boat. So um, there's a there's a good theory that is animals that live on the water have predators that generally approach them from the water and humans are generally terrestrial on the land and so if we are on the land a lot of water uh, birds will look at us like a predator but if we get in the water with them sometimes i've noticed they tend to be a little bit more tolerant maybe a little bit more cooperative using uh, my words there so yes and no of course every individual is different uh, but I think that it can help you get closer for sure because they don't generally, you know, look at that kind of a predator coming at them from the water side. Any other thoughts on uh, blinds or hides uh, before we go? When I'm in my, my car, my portable moving 
blind. I like to be in an area where there's not a lot of fast moving vehicle traffic. So I'm off, hopefully off the you know pavement. Uh, I like to drive about 20 miles an hour at the top, maybe 15 miles an hour or slower. I like to have my window down with my window mount attached and my lens right next to me on my seat. And I'm driving slowly looking ahead. If I see something up ahead that potentially could be a photo, I'll put my lens on real quickly, tighten it down without jerky herky movements and continue to roll into position slowly. And, um, and then when I get in position, I don't have to move. I can slowly stop the car and the lens is already, you know, set to all the proper settings and it's on the mount and I'm in position. And if the subject is cooperative, then I'm good to go. Uh, so that's a, a tip I like to use in that situation. And then in the, in the floating blind, it's kind of the same kind of thing. I like to get in the floating blind and then move slowly uh, into position with my feet touching the ground for safety for me as well as my equipment. And then um, just try to stay put and just let the world of the animal come back to its normal with me blending in into nothing and just movement, quiet. It all just kind of goes away and blends in. Some of my favorite moments in a blind are just having the world of nature around me. You know, snakes, I've had snakes pop their head up in, in my floating blind going, hey, what are you doing here? Um, and, you know, and then swimming away. I've had uh, underwater beetles bite through my, um, my chest waders and it's like, that hurt, what the heck was that? There's some really interesting invertebrates that can bite you and you notice it and there's some um you know but it's not anything that's going to send you to the doctor uh, but you just notice it it's kind of those kinds of things are fun and then the sounds and the smells and so i guess i would leave you with just being in a blind can be for me very zen like and to just open up and be open to the the experience of being in nature and the fact that we are so lucky that we have these opportunities to be in nature because it's truly an opportunity to uh, be healthier, be happier, and enjoy the moment. And so I might not get a picture, but if I'm in a setting like that and I hear the sounds and the smells and um, uh, just being there, I'll often come home rejuvenated. Um, you know, and I've been doing a lot of research on the health effects of being in nature. That's a whole nother podcast. Maybe you can, uh, be interested in just the, the, um, the value of nature in our human world today and how valuable it is to all of us. And for me, through my photography, uh, that's how I get my, my doses of nature in, in, uh, excess, but also there's times when I'm just okay with, you know what? The photo isn't working today, but my goodness, isn't it nice to be here? Very well said. Before we go, talk about where people can find you, your books, your workshops, and all the things that you do. Yeah, thanks, Kirby. So my website is jeffrichphoto.com, www.jeffrichphoto.com, J. Oh, I'm sorry, jeffrichphoto.com. My email is jrich at jeffrichphoto.com. There's a link there for, for my books. I have a baby bird book. I have my complete guide to bird photography, which has been quite successful. The first uh, edition sold out in, in just over a year. The second edition came out in June, doing quite well. Uh, my newest book came out in May of 2018, Bald Eagles in the Wild. And then there's also a link on there for some of my trips. And I'm starting to um, lead a few more trips. I've got a trip this summer of 2019 to Ecuador uh, for birds. I have uh, some local Northern California waterfowl and baby bird options. Uh, and then I'll be spending some time in Alaska photographing eagles. And so I'm going to have a couple tours in Alaska. First one being... November of 2019 up in Haines, Alaska, um, and then I'll be taking a group back to Homer, Alaska for Eagles uh, in the spring 
Uh, so I've got a lot of some photo tour opportunities as well you can find on my website. So thank you, Kirby, for asking and uh, really appreciate that. And uh, if there's any other way I can help, you can send me an email or something. I'm always open to help people and answer questions. Good. Well, thanks for being on again, Jeff. It's always a pleasure. Each episode of Photographing the West, along with the show notes, is published on the 15th and 30th of each month on my website, www.flanaganphotos, F-L-A-N-A-G-A-N-F-O-T-O-S dot com on iTunes, SoundCloud, and most other RSS feeds. Do me a favor and leave us a review on iTunes if you enjoyed the show. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk soon. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to Photographing the West podcast. Please subscribe to the podcast in iTunes and leave us a review. Till next time, here's wishing you safe travels and good light.